Well, this morning we come to um, a new section of Scripture. You know, we take it in bites, and so we'll take a paragraph of the letter that we're studying, and we'll work on it, we'll chew on it for a Sunday or two or three, and uh, this morning we move on to a new passage in Philippians. You will need your Bible open to Philippians 1 this, uh, this morning. I'm going to point out some things that are not on the outline, so please take your Bible and open it, and I'm going to ask you to notice a couple of things uh, in just a moment um, as we come to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27 through 30. And again, if you're uh, watching by uh, internet, you can simply go to our church website and download these notes, uh, either with the answers or without them. All of them are there. Uh, Adrian Castil- uh, Castellano is all, or Castillo is also translating these messages into Spanish as far as the outline goes. So um, if you're interested in that, next week we'll tell you how you can start to receive those. They won't be available before the Sunday, but they will be available after Sunday as he and some others work on those in the days ahead. So notice the title of the message, You Are Citizens of Heaven, Honor Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. We read the passage. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28. And not frightened in anything or in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign of them, of their destruct to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his namesake. Verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Where have we been so far? Look at the review with me. For those who are new to us, here's the background. Paul writes from a prison in Rome to the Philippian church which he planted, and he loves these people. We see that in chapter 1. He awaits execution, chained to a Roman soldier, and the the Philippians endure much trouble as well. So the writer is having trouble, and the recipients are having trouble. But yet, look at number 3. Paul rejoices that whether he lives or dies, the salvation of God is his what? His sure hope. His joy is not based upon his circumstances. That's what we see here. His circumstances are very difficult. His joy is based upon God's salvation. His joy was fed by people's prayer, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and God's salvation promises. Look at number four. This is new to us this morning from last week. Paul shows us that life is worth living when living for Christ's glory in others. Life is worth living when living for Christ's glory in others. He is saying to them, I am going to remain because of you. I am glad to remain because of you, writing to the Philippians, saying, for your good, for, your, for Christ's glory in you, I continue. And he also recognizes that And that death is worth dying because it leads to glorious union. It leads to glorious union with Christ. He's saying, when I finally do die, which is much better, he says, I will be at home in heaven with my Savior. So he is recognizing to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, when we come to verse 27, we... Uh, see a little bit of a change in the way things go. And I want you to, I want you to notice this. Note that there's a big shift. Um, fill that in if it's not already. It's a big shift from biographical information and biographical, biographical relationship with the Philippian people to now some instructions. 
So far, he hasn't been instructing them so very much. He has been talking about his relationship to them. Look with me in chapter 1 and verse 3 in your Bible. This is why I want your Bible open this morning for you to see this. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So he starts off the letter saying, we're related. I remember you. You remember me. I am grateful for what, I, what God has done. Look down at verse 7. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You see, this is very personal, biographical information together, very affectionate words that are here. That, and then look at verse 12. I want you to know brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, they heard he's in prison. They heard that he's under hard circumstances, and he's affirming to them, hey, God's in control. The gospel is going forth, even though I'm here in prison. And we see this, and he he even tells about a struggle that he has. Look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not, sincere, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. He's saying, yeah, there's, it's hard being in prison, but what's even harder is that people are preaching the true gospel, but for the wrong reasons, and even sometimes in rivalry with me. And so all of that is seeking to hurt him. So all of this has been very, very personal. We go on in verse uh, 18 and 19 where he says, Yes, I rejoice, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So again, you're hearing all of these things of just just really rejoicing in his relationship with them, affirming that God is with him. This is a bit of the biographical story of what's going on between them. But now, like so many other letters that Paul has written, it turns to the instructional. And so our text this morning, up there in verse 27, it starts off with a shift of instruction. And the first big instruction he makes, and fill this in on your outline, the first big instruction is this, make sure your life shows Christ. He's saying to the Philippians, yes, we have this deep relationship. I'm grateful for that. But now I want to focus on things that you need to hear me say. Now he's moving into a pastoral role. Now he's moving into a bit of a parental role with this church that he loves. And he's going to give some direct instructions that are very, very important. Notice that I put in your notes here, and this is just underneath underneath that first big instruction statement there. In verse 27, it says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, what's interesting about this is from verse 27 all the way to verse 30 is is one sentence in the original Greek language. So, Paul is the master of run-on sentences, and you can get away with that in Koine Greek. Um, That's okay. But in English, it doesn't work so well because we start dividing things up and starting to become confused about what is related to what. And so the English translation has, has appropriately broken this long statement up into two different sentences, um, sometimes three different sentences depending on the translation and how it would go. But one of the things in Greek language is this. There are some devices in Greek that when you put a key word at the beginning of the sentence, it is used to make a powerful point. It's used to elevate one part of the thought more than other parts of the thought, and at least to emphasize them. And so notice this, circle the word only in verse 27. He is putting the word only at the beginning of this long sentence. And it's because he wants to clarify that there's that there's a great emphasis on the fact that you're to only live in a manner worthy of Christ. He's not just saying live in a manner worthy of Christ. He's saying only live in a manner worthy of Christ. 
So there's a restrictive nature of this. It, there's the prescriptive, go do this, but there's also a negation of other things. He's saying there are things that should not be in your life. There is a manner of life that is not for you as a follower of Christ. And this is so very clear. So notice this, only being placed at the first word of the long sentence highlights the emphatic nature, the emphatic nature of this instruction. There's no room for other behavior is what we should gain from this. And then we go to the next phrase, and this is really the the key part of my message this morning is, he's saying, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, this, this idea of let your manner of life, if you have a New American Standard, it says conduct yourselves. So it has to do with conduct. It has to do with your behavior. It has to do with the way in which you live. So he's saying, let your manner of life or conduct yourselves. And this word, it's a very interesting word. You see it there. It's a long Greek word. Uh, It looks like you see polite at the beginning of it. It's it's really where we get the idea of politeness. Um, But polyluthuse is this picture. It's live as a citizen. Now, this is an important statement. Paul is doing something here, and if you don't think about the biblical background of the church at Philippi, if you don't think a little bit about the language issue of of Greek, and if if you don't look at the background here, you'll miss a very important, beautiful section of this passage. And this is why we often say the Bible is so rich, it's worthy of you taking a good look. The Bible is, that man, every single word means something. The way God has put this together, the way God has written it for us, there's always purpose, and it's beautiful. And you're going to see something here, I think, in the next two minutes that's really cool. Notice that this word that is used for conduct yourselves or live in a manner worthy of Christ is relating to the situation of Philippi and the people of Philippi. Paulus means city. That's literally what it means. And so, Paul is, listen to this, Paul is using a phrase to the Philippian people that they are not going to apply to their Roman citizenship so much as they're going to apply it to their spiritual citizenship. Let's see what we mean. Fill this in. Philippi was a colony of Rome and Macedonia. Now, understand this. This means they had special status. There were lots of other towns in Macedonia, um, which is modern-day Greece. There were lots of other towns, but they weren't Roman towns. Rome had selected Philippi as a key place, maybe almost like a county seat of their governance. Rome was in charge of the Mediterranean world very solidly at this point. They were the powerful empire. They had subjugated all of the other places, including Macedonia. And so when they wanted to project their power, they would put colonies out in their empire at different places. And it was there that those colonies got special treatment because they were often filled with one, Roman, real Roman citizens, not just subjugated peoples, but Roman citizens. The governors would often be there. They were powerful places. In fact, listen to this, they would often speak Latin in those cities. And so they wouldn't be speaking Greek or some of the other languages that would be around the empire. They would often be speaking Latin in that city. So this was a powerful Roman city in Greece. Number two, notice this, Philippi had special status and esteem. And so the people that were around Philippi, people who lived in Philippi, they knew that. And whether they were a Roman citizen or whether they were really somebody from the surrounding area that didn't have citizenship, they still saw the esteem and the special status that was given for being a Roman in Philippi. Look at the next part there. Philippian citizens maintained a certain dignity and decorum representing Rome. So there was a certain air about them. It wasn't merely arrogance and pride and subjugation of others. It was about this thing that they were part of something bigger than they were. 
They saw the glory of Rome, and they saw the glory of the empire, and they wanted to live in such a way that would make them a good citizen of civility and the rule of law and the rule of order. Many other places in the world, they didn't have rule of law. There was, there was rampant crime. There was banditry. There were all kinds of other things that would happen. But the Romans were projecting the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome around the whole empire, and that was something that a real Roman citizen, they were really proud of that. And they wanted to be a good citizen of not just Rome the city, but of, of the Roman Empire. Now, take that and let's do something with this. I, I want you to see this just a little bit clearer. Some of you have, have seen uh, the film Gladiator. And um, you remember the final scene in the film of Gladiator. Uh, film story being it's a Roman period epic film that is f- it's the fictional but, but plausible story of the struggle for, pa- for power after the death of Marcus Aurelius. And it's in this final scene um, where the story of Marcus Aurelius' deranged son, Commodus, is slain by the loyal, honorable uh, Roman general Maximus Decimus Meridius. And so Maximus Decimus Meridius is also there, and he, having received a mortal wound, falls dead on the floor of the Colosseum. So both the deranged son and the general who slays him, taking the kingdom away from him, both have died. One dying because of his selfishness, the other one dying because of his loyalty as a Roman citizen. Lucella, Marcus Aurelius' daughter, steps forward and calls on the surrounding Roman legion, the senators that are present, and Maximus' own men to honor him in his death since he had honored Rome in his life. And look what the storyline of the movie puts forth. And this catches the flavor of what we see that Paul is reaching out to. She says, He was, excuse me, was Rome worth one good man's life? We believed it once. Make us believe it again. He was a soldier of Rome. Honor him. And so there is this great honor that is there. There is this great privilege of representing what Rome would stand for. There is this great picture of the nobility of a certain way of life, a certain conduct that was befitting for a Roman soldier. Barbarians may act one way, others would act another way, but Romans were to be above those things in civility and rule of law. And so the picture was that we, we honor this way. And so she is projecting that out, calling them. Now, in a similar way, we see the, the apostle Paul is telling us far more to honor Christ. Look what we see here, the, the, the affiliation of this. The Philippian church was a colony not of Rome, but was a colony of heaven in Philippi. And so here are Christians that are in the city of Philippi, and Paul is saying to them, by this conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, especially using the citizenry language, he is saying to them that you represent a different power. You represent a superior power, the superior power of heaven. Look at the next part. The Philippian church had a special standing in Christ, yet still in the world. So Paul is recognizing to them or or pointing out to them the way he says this, that, that you're in Christ yet still here. You're in a colony. Look at the next part. The Philippian church was to maintain a holy life representing Christ, not the world. Representing something so much greater than even a Roman city or empire. So look at the statement under the box on page two. If the citizens of Philippi were so devoted to the honor of their human kingdom, how much more should believers in Christ who are bought by the blood of God's Son be devoted to his eternal kingdom? That's the point that Paul is making. He's saying, look, if if you see all around you people that honor Rome 
That's a pretty good indicator. We have something so much better to honor. So live just like they seek to honor Rome. You seek to honor Christ. So notice this at the top of the page in the box. He says, only conduct, excuse me, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is the way in which we are to live. Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 14 is so similar to this, also written by, by Paul, but to uh, the, the Colossae church. And notice it's in, verse, or it's in chapter 1, so it's at the beginning of the letter. And look what he says in verse 10. He says, so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Very similar phrase. Fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So it's not just missional, but it's growing. We talked about this in starting point a few minutes ago, that some churches immediately just say, mission, 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 go do, go do, go do, go do. Well, you need to be careful about that. If you turn Christianity into just good works, good works, good works, then you can subtly pass along the message that the real truth here is all about our good works. When the real message of the Bible is about the good work of Jesus Christ and that he has created us to come and join him in his good works, but it's all based upon what he has done. And so here we see that you're to grow into uh, bearing good fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So that's why we study the Scripture. That's why you need to read the Bible when you're at home. This is why you need to study and consider the things of God deeply, grow in your understanding of Him. Look at verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. It's a very similar vein here that we see this. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So here, look at the beginning of verse 10 in Colossians 1. He says, so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And then look at verse 14 in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This God who would come and buy us back, that's redemption, to buy it back. He buys us back out of our sin, exactly what Chuck Samarius just prayed in his pastoral prayer, that this is the gospel, that God comes, and for all who believe in him and recognize that he has done the work necessary to clean us up and make us ready for him, that our redemption is in him, not ourselves. And because he has done this, because he has done this by going to the cross, even death on a cross, we are to walk in a manner, manner that represents that, that is, in, that is worthy of that sacrifice that was made for us. So what does it mean to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? I'd like for us to just take a few minutes and really deeply think about that. Number one, I want us to just say, and there's several things for you to fill out here, and I want us to do this gently and carefully. I want us to do this kind of reflectively as we go through this, because I really want you to consider what does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of Christ. First of all, Christians are to live a life that is consistent with God's revealed word. Our emotions are not what dictate the way we live. What seems right to us in our own eyes is not the way that we live our manner of life. We need to know what God has said because our hearts can deceive us. Circumstances around us can be wrong. Listen to this. The culture that's screaming its values and its methodology for life and everything else, the culture is shouting to us how to live. But the Bible makes so very clear that in a fallen world, to listen to the surrounder culture, it brings you to death. And I don't mean just physical death. It could do that as well. But it brings you to spiritual death, separation from God. So what we need is the words of life. And so the book of life that God has determined for us in his truth and calling us to himself, this is the way in which we are called to live according to the revealed word of God, not the culture around us. 
So Christians are to live in a consistent way in this, in what they believe. Fill that in, in what you believe. What you believe matters. You need to believe the truth, not the falsehoods of the world around us. You need to understand that it's in what they preach. I've already filled that one in for you. We preach that with the way that we preach on Sunday mornings, but also as you speak the word out in the community to the people around you, we need to be careful about what we say. Look at the next part there. It's what they defend. Christians are only to defend the truths from God's word. We should not defend the falsehoods of the world around us. Now, let me tell you that we live in a culture that increasingly is calling you to defend falsehood. And they will shame you for not defending falsehood. We are increasingly seeing a pressure from the culture to say, don't tell me that adultery is really wrong. Don't tell me that fornication is wrong. Don't tell me that that homosexuality is wrong. Don't tell me that these other things, don't you force your, defend with us. And they're not only saying, don't say it to me, but now they are calling on you to defend their values. And if you don't defend their values, then they will ostracize you. The tide is shift on this. There's not just a cultural shift. There's not just a cultural uh, crisis that has come in here and a sexual, um, a sexual movement that is here. It's now become a sexual revolution, a true revolution. And when there's a revolution, what it seeks to do is to destroy the opposition. That's what revolutions do. If there's a revolution in a country, typically the idea is you bring in the new power, the new laws, the new leaders, and if anybody stands for the old ones, what happens? They are, they are put down. They are silenced. And that's what we see even happening in our culture. And that's why we would put here what we defend. We need to be careful that as followers of God, as followers of what he has designed, what he has ordained, what he has clearly said in his word, we want to be careful that we don't allow the materialism or the sexual immoralities or the misplaced values and all of the things that that come from obsession with media or obsession with entertainment or obsession with vacation or obsession with pleasure, that all of these things, that we don't defend those things. We are called to defend the things that God says are true and right. And so this would also be, in Christians are to live a consistent life with God's revealed word, in their morality, in their words, in the way that they speak and what they say, in their actions, what we do with our with our bodies, what we do with our hands, what we do with our lives. And here again, in our values, we are to be consistent with God's Word in what we value and in their affections, the things that we love, and in their attitude. All of these, this is what it means to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. You know, there's some people that would say, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a Christian, I'm just a little angry, just the way I am. You know, I'm annoyed with most people. Nobody knows how to drive. Nobody knows how to drive a a grocery cart in Publix or their car. And, you know, they just kind of run around torqued. Their attitude is not an exemplary attitude. They tend to be negative. You know, immediately the conversation goes to all the things that are wrong in the world or all the things that somebody else did. You see, those are attitudes that are not becoming of the way of Christ, the hope and the joy that there is in Christ, the, the, the reality the world needs to see as light. Jesus said, shine your light before men. Don't hide it. Come and be part of that which proclaims the glory of Christ in this life. And that, that has to do with all of these things in the way that we live. So Paul is saying, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Don't allow there to be another way to live in your life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Verse 12 says, we encourage you and comforted you, we encouraged you and comforted you as we urged you, underline it, to walk in a manner worthy of God 
who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You see, again, it's a different kingdom. We're leading, we're living in a different kingdom. We may live in Philippi, but it's just a little colony of heaven for us. And that is the picture, that we have a different kingdom. We march to the beat of a different drum. We answer to the voice of a different caller. Look at verse 13. And we continually thank God because when you received the word that you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as the true word of God. Finally then, brothers, he says in chapter 4, finally then, brothers, we ask you, we, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk, underline that, how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. You see, Christians are to be growing in what it means to honor God. Sheridan Hills would not be a faithful church if we just said, yeah, just come and sit and stay just like you are. I'd be a bad pastor. The pastors would be bad elders. The deacons and the wives of the deacons, we, we would not be good leaders. We would not be good servants if we said, yeah, just, just come, do your little Christian duty on Sunday morning like you've done God a favor by sitting here and then leave without really participating in the life of the church, without really giving in the life of the church of your time and your life and your experience and your, your troubles and your sorrows and your joys. You see, we are to be growing in the things of God, and a lot of that has to do with fellowship and relationship. And there are people in the life of this church that need you. And there are people in the life of this church that need what you, you say, I don't have anything to offer. Pastor, if you only knew how messed up I am. Well, this is saying, come and let God straighten you out. Grow more and more in Him, and let Him use you. This is the picture of what a true church ought to be. And what he's saying is, this is what it means to walk in a manner worthy of God. And in in Thessalonians, it's making clear, look at Thessalonians again, at the end of verse 13, it says that you accepted it not as the word of men, underline that, but as the true word of God. You see, we get this from God's word. This is how we know how to walk. This is why you need to read your Bible. This is why you need to hear God speak about your morality and about your values and about your time and about your marriage and about your parenting and about your work life and about your extended family life and about how you forgive people and how you minister to people. This is God's Word deals with all of that. And it's that is the, the call that we allow the, man, the, the manner worthy of the gospel to come to us clearly from His Word. Look at number two. What does it mean to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Number two, Christians are to expect opposition and to stand firm in it. And this is what we see in this whole text. And we're going to look at this more next Sunday. But if the picture is, why are we to expect opposition? Because the fallen world is hostile to God. You see, we live in a universe that is fallen. We live in a universe where we decided we know better than God. And as a result of that, the sin that has entered into the human experience, not only the human experience, but into creation, has been opposed against God and is hostile toward God. You can look up these verses in Romans 1, Ephesians, or Romans 5, Ephesians 2, Colossians 1, that before we come to Christ, we are with the world hostile toward God. Now, if that is the case of what's around us, they are going to be hostile toward us. Look at the next part. And because it hates God in his ways, it will hate us as we are faithful to him. That is a reality. So don't be surprised when that happens. When you stand for God, and I'm not saying be obnoxious, and I'm not saying that you have to go out there and try to harm people with the truth of the, of the gospel. What I'm saying, though, is, is when it comes down to it and the world rejects your values and my values because we are standing upon what God has said is right and wrong, the world will be opposed to us. In fact, if there is no opposition in your life, I wonder how much you're really confessing Christ. If you don't ever experience opposition in your... Now, I'm not saying go out there and drum up some opposition. (laughs) 
you know, going to go be odd for God or brash and hash, you know, that's, that's not what we're saying here. But if we are, are faithfully living and taking the opportunities that God has, has given us around us, there's, there is going to be, the gospel is offensive. The gospel is offensive to sinful hearts. And if you try to remove the offensiveness of the gospel and emasculate the gospel, then you're not really teaching the gospel. You may be just deceiving people. God just loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. If, that, if that's all they ever hear, come add God to your mix. As opposed to come to God, learn of Him, repent before Him, turn to Him, turn from your sinful ways, trust in Him and not yourself. This is the picture where opposition sometimes will come. But these are the words of life. In John 15, in Matthew chapter 5, in 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3 says, all who are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer hardship. And that's because they are indeed living a life that is worthy. Um, so we need, we need to recognize that opposition will come. Peter has to write to the to the, the people that are in the Mediterranean world of the church and they are experiencing opposition. And he says, don't be surprised when this fiery ordeal has come upon you. Notice number three. Christians also are to expect God's help and rejoice in it. So this is the glorious part, that in the midst of our being representatives of a kingdom um, in which we are sojourners, we are representing Christ, and He is with us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Put on there, I am to be a conduit. I am to be a river of God's grace flowing through me to the lives of others. You know, when, when you come in contact with people that are hurting in our society and you come to them and you seek to love them to God, you seek to comfort them and care for them and you speak the words of Christ, sometimes they will receive that and rejoice in that. Other times they will reject that. But here's the picture. As God has come and worked in you, you are to go and be used of him in the lives of others. As Christians, I, I think about the fact that some of you have gone through great trials in your life and you've wondered, why is this? I would say this. Listen for how God wants to use that thing that you went through back then in people's lives now that are going through the same thing. You've been there. You've experienced it. You've gone through the pain, the loss, the hurt, the trouble, the frustration, the anger, all of the things that the trouble perhaps brought. And by God's grace, hopefully, you've come out on the other side with him. You can allow God to use that. That's what this verse is about. Look at this again. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Look what it says, verse 4. Who comforts us in all of our troubles, underline this, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. This is the beautiful way in which God takes your sorrow and turns it into joy that you are used of him in somebody else's life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, look at these words, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So the picture is, as you walk in a manner worthy of God, he, opposition is going to come. There is going to be trouble and hardship, but there is also going to be the glorious help that only God can give. The glorious in way in which he calls us to honor him and be strengthened by him. So, my question is this. Who or what have you been honoring in your life? Who or what have you been honoring in your life? 
Have you been honoring yourself? Have you been honoring the world around you? Have you been adopting the values of television, the things that are there? Last night, I was telling Marcy this morning, on one of these typical regular channels, there was, there was um, one of these reality shows of some sort, and it was, I just watched the ad. Actually, it was, it was an advertisement. Is it called Bravo? Is that what it is? I don't know. It was, I, was, I think I was watching one of the news channels, and there was a 30-second ad, and the whole ad was about this TV show that you can watch that just, it's everything that Sodom and Gomorrah would celebrate. I mean, it was all about sexual immorality. And it was all about intrigue. Are you into this? Are you into that? Are you into this? You know, guys and gals and threes and fours and fives. I mean, or, I mean the, the whole thing was there. And it was supposed to be advertising it, drawing people. Now, it bothers me that there's people in the world that would make a show like that. But you know what really bothers me is that there's millions who would watch it. You see, this is not the way of Christ. Being in a culture and, and watching the, the types of things and, and engrossing ourselves in the way of the world that is around us is a hideous, hideous example to the world of what a Christian is. And so when the world comes in and they see us and they see the selfishness of the world in us, and they see all of the ways of the world in us, if we are no different, they look at that and say, I've already got all that. But when they come in and they look at us and they see a life that's being lived for something far greater than the present pleasures of sin for a season, when they start to see life that is being lived with real values of real relationship in real health, in our, in our relationship with each other, in our relationship with God, when they see lives lived by glorious, joyful conviction, they start to see something that is worth living for and that's worth dying for. But if when they look at our lives, we talk just like they do, we act just like the way they do, we, we provoke just like they provoke, we, we seek to gather, 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 or we're afraid and everything just like they are. Now, I'm not talking about acting about something that you, like something that you're not, but I am talking about living our lives in a manner that's worthy of God. You see, living in fear for our job or living in fear about finances, living in fear about these things and obsessed with these things, that's not the way that's worthy of Christ. Jesus deals with that. He says, trust me. Learn to trust me. Learn to see that I will take care of you. And so Christians are to live in a manner that's very different than the way of the world. This can, this can even reflect on, on the decisions we make financially. I was reading this week about how uh, the new trend, one of the new disastrous trends economically for our country, is that people are buying new cars and they're carrying over debt from the cars that they've been driving, and they're just adding that debt onto the cars that they have. So you buy a $27,000 cheap whatever it is, and you pay $54,000 on it. Why? Because you've just carried on more debt and more debt. You see, that's the way of the world. That's the foolishness of the world that I have to have a new car. I have to have status. I have to have this. I have to have this. I got to have this house. I got to have that house. And it doesn't matter whether it's wise or not. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. You know, what he's saying is, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's not obsessed with our status in front of everybody else. It's not obsessed with having the things of this life, but it's obsessed with his glory on the earth and living a life that is reflecting him. You see, there's, there's many things that we could talk about here where Christians are tempted to go along with the world as opposed to living a life that is worthy of Christ. I'd like to ask you to look at the screen and see Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Just look at this verse that's up there, Acts 3, 19. Look what it says. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come 
from the presence of God. Would you please read that out loud with me? Let's read it out loud. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Just, just look at that verse. How do you have God's refreshing presence? How do you… You see, it's not His condemning presence. It's His refreshing presence. How do you have that? You have that from having your sins wiped away. And that's why Jesus died, is to cleanse us from all of our sins, all of our ungodliness. And how do we experience His cleansing? We repent and turn to Him. We repent of our evil ways. We repent of our unbelief. We repent of our false belief that maybe it's me who's going to save myself. It's my good works or it's my things or it's just loving the world as opposed to loving him and his kingdom. Repent and return. I cannot tell you the number of times that Acts 3.19, even as a Christian, has helped me to remember how to experience God's presence and His grace. I continually am called to live in repentance. I'm continually called to live, returning to the Lord and honoring Him, living a life that's, man, that's lived in a worthy manner of the gospel. Now, maybe you've never yet come to Him like that. I want to encourage you this morning, for the, maybe the, for the first time, to truly just come to Him and just repent of your ways and say, Lord, You're the Savior. I'm the sinner. Come and save me. But for the Christian that's already been there and, and truly has been walking with the Lord at different times in your life, I ask you, are you living a life that's truly worthy of the Lord? Was Philippians written in part for you? Saying, come, remember the worthy manner of honoring God and not yourself and not the world. So Acts 3.19 is this. It is a calling and a command with an amazing promised blessing. It's a calling and a command with an amazing promised blessing. I hope and pray that today you will run to that blessing through repentance. Would you stand with me for prayer?